Szanowni Państwo, dzień dobry. Nazywam się Kajetan Prochyra i w imieniu Muzeum Historii Żydów Polskich Polin mam przyjemność przywitać Państwa na dzisiejszej konferencji. Z częścią z Państwa widzieliśmy się tutaj rok temu podczas naszej pierwszej konferencji edukacyjnej pod tytułem Uczyć o ludobójstwie. I sukces zmobilizował nas do tego, aby tego typu spotkania uczynić wydarzeniem cyklicznym zawsze na początku każdego kolejnego roku szkolnego. W tym roku temat naszej konferencji to jak rozmawiać o sprawiedliwych, reprezentacja w kulturze, znaczenie w edukacji. O otwarcie konferencji proszę Zygmunta Stępińskiego, wicedyrektora Muzeum POLIN. A szanowni Państwo, Panie Prezydencie, Szanowna Pani Ambasador Stanów Zjednoczonych, Szanowna Pani Ambasador Izraela, drodzy goście, przedstawiciele ocalałych i sprawiedliwych, wszyscy, którzy zabiorą dzisiaj głos, przyjaciele muzeum, nauczyciele i nauczycielki. A jesteśmy bardzo dumni, że w Muzeum Polinius drugi raz organizuje tak ważną konferencję edukacyjną. A jest to możliwe dzięki wsparciu Ambasady Stanów Zjednoczonych w Polsce oraz Jewish Foundation for Righteous z Nowego Jorku z, nieocen z nieocenioną pani Stanley Stahl. Ale również dzięki ogromnemu i stałemu wsparciu miasta stołecznego Warszawy, szczególnie Biura Edukacji oraz naszego partnera Centrum Edukacji Obywatelskiej. Tematem konferencji, tematem konferencji jest rozmowa z młodymi ludźmi, przede wszystkim z uczniami o człowieczeństwie i o podstawowych wartościach humanistycznych. To trudny temat. Dlatego tym bardziej nam zależy, by wesprzeć pedagogów, by poprzez uczestnictwo a w takiej konferencji jak ta otrzymali i materiały, i pewną wiedzę, i pewne propozycje do dalszego nauczania. A sprawiedliwi, a szerzej wszyscy ratujący Żydów podczas II wojny światowej to bohaterowie. Trzeba o nich mówić i przybliżać ich sylwetki, szczególnie młodym ludziom, bo mogą być za nim wzorem. Tylko co właśnie mówić? Więc zastanówmy się wspólnie, jak uczyć młodych ludzi szacunku do innych, bez względu na to, kim są, skąd pochodzą, jaki mają kolor skóry i religię. A to w wielu miejscach na świecie, nie jest już tak oczywiste i proste. Możemy więc użyć przykładu sprawiedliwych, by pokazać, jak ważne jest opowiedzenie się w całym swoim życiu za dobrem, zwłaszcza w sytuacjach skrajnych, wymagających prawdziwego człowieczeństwa i ogromnej odwagi cywilnej. Eli Weisel napisał, zawsze zajmuj stanowisko. Neutralność pomaga opresorowi. Nigdy ofierze. Cisza zachęca dręczyciela, nigdy osobę dręczoną. Always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Te słowa powinny być śmiotem naszej konferencji. Dziękuję bardzo. Teraz o zabranie głosu poproszę pana Piotra Szpanowskiego, zastępcy dyrektora Departamentu Dziedzictwa Kulturowego w Ministerstwie Kultury i Dziedzictwa Narodowego. Dzień dobry państwu. Mam zaszczyt odczytać list skierowany do państwa przez sekretarza stanu w Ministerstwie Kultury i Dziedzictwa Narodowego pana Jarosława Selina który ze względu na obowiązki służbowe Komitet Stały Rady Ministrów nie mógł przybyć osobiście. List skierowany do uczestników Międzynarodowej Konferencji Edukacyjnej Jak rozmawiać o sprawiedliwych, reprezentacje w kulturze, znaczenie w edukacji, Muzeum Historii Żydów Polskich, POLIN. 
Szanowni Państwo, przede wszystkim dziękuję za zaproszenie na tę niezwykle ważną w perspektywie edukacji przyszłych pokoleń konferencję. Witam obecnych przedstawicieli państwa Izrael, w tym ambasador Izraela w Polsce, panią Annę Azari oraz ambasador Stanów Zjednoczonych, panią Georgette Mosbacher oraz wszystkich pozostałych gości, wyróżniając zwłaszcza współzałożycieli obok ministra kultury i dziedzictwa narodowego, współzałożycieli muzeum, prezesa Stowarzyszenia Żydowski Instytut Historyczny w Polsce i wiceprezydenta miasta stołecznego Warszawy. Jestem przekonany, że konferencja przygotowana przez Muzeum Historii Żydów Polskich POLIN będzie doskonałą okazją do wymiany myśli i doświadczeń, co pozwoli na pogłębienie wiedzy o sposobach i kierunkach rozwoju edukacji o sprawiedliwych oraz wypracowaniu najbardziej odpowiedniej formy dla przekazywania opowieści o heroicznej postawie osób ratujących Żydów skazanych na zagładę przez niemiecką trzecią Rzeszę. Tak, aby była ona zrozumiała dla kolejnych pokoleń. Zrozumiała także przez objaśnienie zgodnej z prawdą historyczną sytuacji Polaków i Żydów na terenie Polski pozbawionej przez nazistowskie Niemcy nie tylko jakiejkolwiek namiastki państwowości, ale i poddanej brutalnemu terrorowi okupacyjnemu. W zapiskach Emanuela Ringelbluma z warszawskiego getta z roku 1943 znajdujemy taki fragment. Panuje u nas pogląd, że antysemityzm znacznie się wzmógł w okresie wojny, że Polacy w swej większości są zadowoleni z nieszczęścia, które spotkało Żydów w miastach i miasteczkach Polski. Uważny czytelnik naszych materiałów znajdzie setki dokumentów świadczących o czymś wręcz przeciwnym. W moim odczuciu wyżej przytoczony tekst jest swego rodzaju testamentem, który powinien być realizowany przez pracę edukacyjną na rzecz zachowania pamięci o tych sprawiedliwych, którzy ratując życie swoich, a właściwie naszych bliźnich, ocalili również istotę człowieczeństwa. Zdecydowanie ich postawa i niejednokrotnie ofiara życia jest godna upamiętniania, ponieważ nie sprzeniewierzyli się człowieczeństwu, o czym wspomniałem, ale i obowiązkom i prawu stanowionemu, stanowionemu przez polskie państwo podziemne, które zdecydowanie potępiało i karało tych, którzy zdradzali swój naród, wydając i prześladując swych współobywateli Żydów. Takie postawy niestety miały miejsce, ale były one przestępstwem, wyrazem odstępstwa i od zasad moralnych i od obowiązków obywatelskich Polaka. Państwo Izrael, ustanawiając medal Sprawiedliwy wśród Narodów Świata, wskazało, jak ogromną, bezwzględną wartością jest podjęcie decyzji o ratowaniu innego człowieka, wówczas, gdy grozi za to utrata życia własnego, a niekiedy i całej własnej rodziny. Jestem niezwykle dumny, że to Polacy stanowią największą grupę narodową wśród uhonorowanych tym wyjątkowym wyróżnieniem. Wszyscy jednak zdajemy sobie sprawę z tego, że w miarę upływu czasu, znaczonego w tym wypadku nieubłaganym odchodzeniem kolejnych świadków Holokaustu, będziemy musieli sobie radzić bez ich bezpośredniego świadectwa, które choć zapisane w ten czy inny sposób, nie będzie miało już takiej siły przekazu. Dlatego niezwykle ważnym staje się pytanie o metodologię pracy edukacyjnej w zakresie opowieści o sprawiedliwych i ich dramatycznych wyborach. Z satysfakcją stwierdzam, że Muzeum Historii Żydów Polskich, POLIN, dostrzega tę pilną potrzebę i wychodzi jej naprzeciw, poszukując konkretnych rozwiązań. Poszukiwania te nakładają się zaś na rezultaty pracy innych polskich instytucji kultury działających w obszarze badania i upamiętniania wydarzeń czasu zagłady. W tym zwłaszcza tak zasłużone jak Żydowski Instytut Historyczny w Warszawie, czy młodszego, ale aktywnie i prężnie działającego Muzeum Polaków ratujących Żydów podczas II wojny światowej imienia rodziny Ulmów w Markowej. Wielkie oczekiwania w tym zakresie adresowane są również wobec Muzeum Getta Warszawskiego, które utworzone przez ministra kultury i dziedzictwa narodowego na początku tego roku w ostatnich dniach sformalizowało przejęcie opieki nad historyczną siedzibą Szpitala Dziecięcego Berzonów i Baumanów w Warszawie. Jestem przekonany, że dziś otwierana konferencja przyczyni się do podjęcia analizy już działających programów edukacyjnych, a także przygotowania kolejnych, 
które wdrażane przez doświadczonych edukatorów zapewnią zachowanie wspólnego dziedzictwa sprawiedliwych dla potomnych. Podpisano Jarosław Selin. Dziękuję. Teraz o zabranie głosu poproszę pana Włodzimierza Paszyńskiego, wiceprezydenta miasta stołecznego Warszawy. Dzień dobry państwu. Całe to spotkanie poświęcone będzie temu, jak uczyć o sprawiedliwych. I to tak naprawdę państwo pewnie wiecie lepiej ode mnie, jak to robić. Dlatego pozwólcie kilka zdań refleksji ogólnej, związanej raczej z tym, dlaczego trzeba uczyć o sprawiedliwych i czego jeszcze trzeba uczyć niejako przy okazji. Przyjrzenie się losom wrośniętych w nasz krajobraz Żydów najlepiej uświadamia sobie, uświadamia, jak trudno oddzielić od siebie żywioły obu kultur. To, co polskie, od tego, co żydowskie i odwrotnie. Dzieje obu narodów splotły się przez minione stulecia w jednorodną fabułę. Znajdujemy w niej wątki dramatyczne, historie sporów i konfliktów, ale także i tych jest niemało, świadectwa pogodnej koegzystencji i współpracy, owocującej bogactwem osiągnięć w nauce, kulturze, gospodarce. Ten wspólny dom ostatecznie zrujnowała II wojna światowa. Innego nie mieli. Nieliczni ocaleni próbowali uwierzyć, że da się go odbudować i znowu wspólnie w nim zamieszkać. Tę nadzieję ostatecznie zniweczył marzec 68 roku, wskazując wyraźnie, kto jest prawdziwym właścicielem tego domu, a kto tylko niechcianym sublokatorem, obcym. Znacznie wcześniej w wierszu Żydom polskim Władysław Broniewski marzył, że jedna powstanie rasa, najwyższa, ludzie szlachetni. Marzenie się nie spełniło. Musiało ustąpić skrzeczącej pospolitości. Za wprowadzenie wątku obcego do bieżących rozgrywek politycznych ostatniego półwiecza chętnie obwiniamy władzę i słusznie. Ale nie wolno zapominać o tym, że ożywione po latach upiory antysemityzmu, węsząc różnorakie łupy, z radosną łatwością potrafią się wkomponować w krajobraz także i dziś. Tak zwany suweren, ośmielony wstrzemięźliwą postawą Kościoła, z niekłamaną radością brał i bierze udział w przygotowanych dlań igrzyskach. Ludzie prawdziwie szlachetnie, jak to często bywa, pozostają w mniejszości. Trzeba się temu przeciwstawiać z całą mocą. Pogarda rodzi się w słowach, brzmiących doniośle, złowrogich i boleśnie raniących. Za nimi idą czyny haniebne w treści, formie i brunatnej kolorystyce. Indoktrynacja, dziś nazywana elegancko polityką historyczną, relatywizacja i marginalizowanie podłości dają przyzwolenie na zło, na jego rozprzestrzenianie się, na nienawiść wobec wszystkiego, co nie mieści się w utrwalanym przez wątpliwej jakości autorytety obrazie świata. Historia jak to historia, lubi się powtarzać. A jeśli towarzyszy jej dewastacja podstaw systemu zwanego demokracją, to znaczy, że krok już tylko dzieli nas od dyktatury, która by się utrzymać, musi dawać chleb i szukając kolejnych wrogów, organizować wspomniane już igrzyska. Udział w nich z pozoru atrakcyjny i tym bardziej niebezpieczny kończy się zwykle tragicznie, bo nigdy nie możemy być pewni, kiedy wrogami staniemy się my sami. Dziś na naszych oczach rodzą się nowi i nowi starzy obcy. 
są lub za chwilę będą winni wszelkiemu złu, jak kiedyś w nie tylko nazistowskiej propagandzie. Wszak piekło to inni. Dlatego tak ważna jest mądra edukacja. Dziękuję bardzo. Teraz, teraz o zabranie głosu chciałbym poprosić jej ekscelencję, panią Georgette Mosbacher, ambasador Stanów Zjednoczonych w Polsce. Madam. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start my remarks, I have to say that the first time I ever came to Poland, I came here for the opening of this museum. So this is my first introduction to Poland, and a spectacular one it is. Thank you, Deputy Director Stepinski, and uh, to the Museum of History of Polish Jews for inviting me to speak today. It is a true honor, and we are always pleased to cooperate with Poland on its valuable programs. I would also like to thank the Ministry of Culture and Natural Heritage for coming and showing official support for this important initiative, as well as Ambassador Azari from the State of Israel. Wonderful to see you again. I would also like to acknowledge the Department of State's Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, Thomas Yagerzy. Tom, nice to see you here today, too. Stanley Stahl, a fellow New Yorker, right there. Thank you for the support that your Jewish Foundation for the Righteous always provides to Holocaust education initiatives in Poland. Thank you. And now, to our esteemed teachers and educators. It is a privilege to stand in front of you all today. You are the world changers on the front lines. You are the people who educate future generations, and you are the ones who influence all the attitudes when it comes to remembering, discussing, and studying the Holocaust. How does one teach, for example, about the unspeakable human tragedy that was the Holocaust? How does one talk about it with young people? How do we use the lessons of the past to teach students of today sympathy, tolerance, understanding? And further, yet how does one engage all these topics when there are so many different memories, perspectives, and emotions associated with the Holocaust? How does one do this when anti-Semitism and bigotry against minorities still persist around the world? There are no easy answers to these questions. We all know that. But that is precisely why this conference is essential. We need to have these discussions. We need to listen. We need to be open-minded. We need to seek greater understanding on issues that shape and inform us. Like Poland, the United States has endured many heart-rendering chapters in our own history. When bigotry directed at minorities has hurt our nation, torn at our national fabric, it is a struggle we regrettably still face. The lessons we have learned from such experiences tell us we have a collective responsibility to make sure we do not tolerate an environment enabling such hideous acts. The best way to do this is through education. The theme of this conference is relevant to, to today's challenges, and so, as a matter of fact, is its timing. In a little more than two weeks from now, 
Poland will celebrate the centennial, centennial of its rebirth in 1918. This is a historic occasion for which Poles should be very proud. It represents an opportunity not only to celebrate the rebirth a hundred years ago of Poland, it also provides an occasion to celebrate the ideals enshrined in Poland's constitution, namely Poland's respect for universal values and the rights of its citizens. It is important that on November 11, that all Polish citizens, regardless of their political, social, ethnic, religious, or economic backgrounds, feel comfortable and safe taking part in peaceful celebrations. November 11th should be a day of unity and tolerance for all Poles. It should be a day where each Polish citizen can celebrate Poland's history side by side with one another. We truly hope November 11 will be a unifying, inclusive, and peaceful day for Poland and all of Poland's citizens. I would like, once again, personally, to thank all of you for supporting the mission of promoting greater understanding, tolerance, and justice through education. The U.S. Embassy is proud to be your partner in this. Thank you, all of you, for taking part in this conference, and I wish everyone the very best as we work together to create a greater tolerance and peace on Earth. Thank you. Teraz o zabranie głosu chciałbym prosić panią ambasador i ekscelencję Annę Azar i ambasador Izraela w Polsce. Dzień dobry wszystkim. Dzień dobry wszystkim gościom z Stanów Zjednoczonych. Dzień dobry wszystkim, kto tutaj pracuje i, i, i główne e, e, przywitam wszystkich nauczycieli, którzy są tutaj. Myślę, że to e, ważne, e, ważne spotkanie, ważne e, seminarium, na którym e, będzie podejmowany bardzo ważny temat. Dla Ambasady Izraela w, w Polsce uroczystości wręczenia medalów sprawiedliwym wśród narodów świata to taka bardzo główny, jeden z naszych głównych tematów. Ze wszystkim, co robimy oprócz tego, a robimy niemało, to dla nas jest jakaś spłata e, długa, e, moralnego, którym, którym mo, możemy, e, możemy, musimy e, robić e, cały czas. I e, nawet myślę, że w końcu listopada akurat tutaj w muzeum będzie następna e, uroczystość wręczenia e, medalu. Jeden temat, który e, e, robi mi troszeczkę, troszeczkę niepokojenne, jestem nie, 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 niezadowolona, to jak jest jakaś banalizacja e, sprawiedliwych. Co, e, o czym myślę? W tych politycznych, historycznych sporach, za często mamy takie, taki pomysł, słyszamy różnych ludzi, którzy mówią o sprawiedliwych, jakby wszyscy byli sprawiedliwi. Wszyscy nie byli sprawiedliwi. Nikt z nas nie może nikogo sądzić e, dzisiaj i ja mam nadzieję, że wasze uczny nigdy nie znajdą się w, w tych sytuacjach, w, w, w których e, potrzebno wy, wybierać, 
co robić w takiej strasznej, okropnej sytuacji. Ale nie wszyscy byli sprawiedliwymi. Nie, nie u wszystkich była ta odwaga. I to, to nawet jasne, dlaczego nie u wszystkich była ta odwaga, kiedy, kiedy za, za to za pomagu Żydom czekała ciebie kara śmierci, nawet nie ciebie, a, a twoją całą rodzinę. I dlatego ja myślę, że za, wszyscy, każda historia sprawiedliwego jest um, inna niż... Um, o, o, oni wszyscy są inni, ale my musimy rozumieć, że my mówimy o bohaterach, który, który musi być moralnym wzorem dla młodych, w nadzieję, że takich sytuacji więcej nie, nie uwidzimy ani tutaj w Polsce, ani całkiem, choć całkiem już były podobne sytuacje w innych częściach świata już po II wojnie światowej. Ja myślę, że mowa o sprawiedliwych to jakaś możliwość Uczenia przyzwoicze, przezwo i pomocy. Może być, jeśli trzeba znaleźć jedno hasło na ten temat, może być ja wybrałam by to hasło, które mówił profesor Bartuszewski i przekazać jego młodym, warto być przyzwoitym. Dziękuję. Teraz o zabranie głosu chciałbym poprosić panią Stanley Stahl, wiceprezes The Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, Żydowskiej Fundacji na Rzecz Sprawiedliwych. Dzień dobry państwu. Dziękuję bardzo. Cieszę się, że Mogę tu być wami. Now I will continue in English. I hope you understood what I said. On the end. I do it better in Hebrew, but I tried my best in Polish. On behalf of the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, a foundation that is dedicated to providing monthly financial support to aged and needy non-Jews, And as Ambassador Azari from the State of Israel said, they were the precious few. We send money to people in 20 countries, and we send between $1.1 million and $1.5 million dollars a year, with the largest amount of money coming here to Poland. We also have an education program. It's at Columbia University in New York City, and I'm so pleased to see many of our teachers who are sponsored by the United States Embassy and the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous to come and study in New York. We are here at Pauline, which is an amazing institution, and I too was here when the museum opened in October. I think it's four years ago. Pauline has won awards from the European Union, and it won the top award for culture and education. You are with amazing, amazing staff here from the Education and Training and Research Departments at Pauline. So all of you are blessed to be in the presence of truly dedicated and committed people. Tomorrow, I will talk about how we teach to the righteous in the United States and perhaps provide some teaching strategies. So I look forward to reconnecting with some of our teachers and to meeting new ones. And so enjoy the conference and dziękuję bardzo.
Szanowni Państwo, wykład otwierający naszą konferencję pod tytułem Jak ratujący Żydów podejmowali trudne decyzje w czasach zagłady wygłosi dr Steven Smith z University of Southern California w Los Angeles. Dr. Smith jest dyrektorem wykonawczym USC Shoah Foundation, The Institute for Visual History and Education, czyli Instytutu Historii Wizualnej i Edukacji, a także doradcą UNESCO do spraw edukacji ludobójstwie. Uh, Dzień dobry and uh, your excellencies, uh, members of government and of the uh, city of Warsaw, thank you so much for being here today uh, to lead us and to guide us, to support us in our work, to the Poland Museum. Um, thank you for ensuring that over the next three days we are reminded of the lives and the work and the, uh, the values of the righteous. To think about what it means to live with their legacies uh, as we get further and further away in history from their actions to think about how we get closer and closer to their values as we teach it to the next generations. And teachers from uh, across Poland, thank you for making the journey to be here today. But mostly thank you for being in our classrooms and teaching our next generation and seeing that these few days of deliberations are worthy of your time. You know, um, the righteous did their work with little thanks. They did their work with little... Um, notice at the time at which they were risking their lives and those of their families. Um, today we are here to highlight their work, to, gr to share gratitude for what they did and who they are. I'm reminded uh, seeing uh, Stanley Stahl up here that how the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous uh, year in and year out is making its mission to say thank you to these people people who are still a part of our community, some of whom are part of the volunteer structure of this museum and honored guests at this museum, who are part of our lives still today. As their legacy slowly passes to us, um, these couple of days are a moment to say to them, thank you for what you have done for us, um, and we take your legacy into our future with great debt of gratitude. So it was the morning of the 27th of January, 1945. War for some was already over. Not for Roddy Edmonds. My comments today uh, will focus somewhat on the specific e experiences of the righteous in Poland. But I'm going to be talking about universal values. Values that affect us all wherever we are, not about a specific time and place, but about who we are as people and what their legacy means wherever we are. Edmonds was standing on the parade ground along with 1,275 US servicemen in the Stalag 9A prisoner of war camp in Germany. As a member of the 422nd Infantry Regiment of the US Army, he'd been incarcerated as a prisoner of war, having been captured behind enemy lines. He was a non-commissioned officer and, as it happens, the most senior that was in that particular camp. And so he was responsible for relaying messages from the camp commandant to the troops. The previous evening, the Germans had told him that only the new Jewish GIs in his group should report to the parade ground for inspection on the morning of the 27th of January. There were approximately 200 Jewish GIs under his command at that moment. So instead, Roddy Edmonds invited all 1,275 men to attend that inspection. As his men stood to attention, the commandant screamed at Edmonds, holding the gun to his head, telling him to identify the Jews. Witnesses that day recount that Edmonds responded, we are all Jews here. If you kill anyone, we will all be witnesses to your crimes and we will provide evidence to the War Crimes Commission. The commandant lowered his gun, stepped away, and no one lost their lives that day, not any day. 
As it happens, Edmonds didn't see much heroism in that act and never told anyone the story. It was only when his son was going through his diary many years later that he tripped across an entry that mentioned this event. So he went and tracked down some of the former GIs, just a few that were still alive, and they verified the story. I mentioned Edmonds because he's one of the most recent righteous among the nations. And two years ago, I had the honor to be with those former prisoners of war who had witnessed that scene at the Israel, Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. as Edmonds' son was given righteous among the nations on behalf of his father. He is the first and only uniformed member of the American Armed Services to receive this prestigious award. So it made me wonder what kind of man Edmonds was to make a decision that took courage and principle. I guess it would have been easy for him to make himself believe that the Nazis wouldn't do any harm to the Jewish GIs. He could have persuaded himself that they wouldn't dare kill American soldiers not that close to the end of the war. His conscience could have told him that the Germans were losing the war and as a prisoner of war camp they would surely know about the Geneva Conventions and stick to the rules as they were wont to do. But there was an underlying moral dilemma. Should he sacrifice 1,075 American soldiers for the sake of 200 Jewish soldiers? Of course, for Edmonds that was not a dilemma at all. He didn't consider what the Germans would or would not do. He only measured the situation by his values, his own personal values. Edmonds probably didn't even see there was a choice to make, even though he made a startling decision. As a man of principle, it was likely a very straightforward decision for him, because as far as he was concerned, none of his men were going to die because he handed them to the Germans. But it wasn't easy. Everyone was safe, but actually everyone was also at risk. Just one difficult choice in difficult times. Edmonds, as it happens, was very quick thinking. You had to be. You had to be everywhere at that time. To show how things quickly changed from day to day, minute by minute, let's listen for a moment to the testimony of Alexandra Berlovich, which we'll listen to in Polish, from the USC Shoah Foundation's archive. <laughs> Nie wiem, to był właściciel fabryki gips i papierosów. Tam taka gilotyna stała do cięcia. Tak, tak, on wiedział, on specjalnie odmurował część hali produkcyjnej. I tam się też chodziło. Jedną z ścianę zamaskował szafkami i na dole w jednej szafce wyjmowało się tylną ścianę i tam się czołgiwało, zasłaniało, maskowało. No ale robotnicy zaczęli zadawać mu niepotrzebne pytania. I trzeba było stamtąd uciekać, co się nazywało wtedy, że kryjówka została spalona. I wtedy ojciec się skontaktował znowu ze wspomnianym już panem Nowińskim. Pamiętam, jak po nas pan Nowiński przyszedł. Od razu, od razu na drugi dzień przyszedł, na stamtąd wyprowadził. Pamiętam, jak w, tej, w tym kantorku Goszczyńskiego pocałował mnie w czoło. A tam byli jeszcze z nami Jedni państwo w Ajnachtowie i oni zginęli. Później zginęli, tak? Coś na dniach. Nas wyprowadzono, a tam myśmy jeszcze zdążyli opuścić tą kryjówkę, a po nich przyszli żandarni i zastrzelili na miejscu. Such a fast and changing situation. Mr. Gościński hides families in his factory. The factory workers begin to realize what's happening in the factory putting the Jews at risk, and presumably Mr. Gorczynski too. Then Mr. Nowinski gets there in the nick of time, and Alexandra Belovich and her family are saved, but of course not the Weinats, because there was no one to take them out. Minute by minute choices, we don't learn what happens to Mr. Gorczynski, but presumably if the Weinats were found there and killed, then blame would have got rested very firmly with Mr. Gorczynski for hiding them there. And so his story isn't really told except through what we hear here. Sort of a second-hand way of learning about his heroism, even though we never learn of his fate. See, courage is not that easy 
to measure. Every situation is different, every person is different. What is an obvious thing for one person to do is extremely challenging for another. We are not born with a courage-ometer to indicate just how courageous we are at any given moment. It's driven by a combination of values and principles, and of course it has to be combined with actions. It's not just enough to think courageously, it requires action too. For example, I could think that I'm going to go to Nigeria next week and rescue young women from Boko Haram. But if I don't actually go and do that, however worthy that cause might be, then it's merely a fantasy in my mind. You have to act on what you think and what your values are for it to be real. That is real in the real world for real people that are at risk. There were doubtless millions of people that thought courageously, but never acted courageously. Maybe they didn't get the chance, or maybe that chance passed them by, or maybe they passed it up. That said, we probably all do courageous things on a daily basis in our own small way. Small actions that we make on an everyday basis which take us out of our comfort zone, perhaps to speak up on behalf of another, or stick to our principles in some way. This, of course, was happening every day during the Second World War, except because of a time of extremity, it was happening on a much grander scale. The Germans were occupying countries with tens of millions of people, each of whom were making decisions on a daily basis about how to survive. There were millions of small acts of courage and of personal defiance that went completely unnoticed and unrecorded. The overall picture of Nazi domination clouds the fact that people were subjugated, but they were not altogether powerless. Not all, of course, were out in the canals or fighting street to street, although many were here in Poland. But, the, but what we find is that many were resisting in very small ways. So what makes the people who rescued Jews specifically all the more noteworthy? Why do the difficult decisions that they made stand out at a time when everyone was making dis difficult decisions every day to fight for their lives? In 1953, the State of Israel founded the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, seen here in this picture, known as Yad Vashem. It is a place of memorial, a museum, a research and documentation center, and a place of learning. Right at its founding, it was decided that one of its tasks would be to recognize the righteous among the nations. Right at its founding. It wasn't a secondary thought. It didn't come later. It wasn't added on as a nice prize to give to worthy people. It was part of the original idea of Yad Vashem itself, that the righteous be recognized. In Hebrew, people who are recognized as such are known as the Hasidei Umot Haolam. The award refers back to a principle in Judaism known as the Ger Toshav, someone who is not Jewish, but who lives by the seven laws of Noah. The Righteous Among the Nations is a national award given by the State of Israel. Yad Vashem was clear that recognizing those who took an ultimate risk in the most difficult times would be right at the heart of their mission to remember the Holocaust itself. They remembered in this olive tree avenue. It's known as the Avenue of the Righteous. It's clear why they did that when faced were documenting evil actions of one group of people, thanking those who showed the alternative beliefs and lived by them is a guiding light not only for the past, but also for the future, our future. It shows it was possible to overcome. I'm going to mention these people a lot this afternoon, so let's be clear about who they are. The Righteous Among the Nations is an award with very high and very exacting standards. It's given to people who risked their lives. They had no financial benefit and had to save at least one person from death. This award requires two witnesses who can verify that the saving act did in fact take place and that the individual made the choice to act with no personal benefit in mind or at stake. 
Today, there are over 26,500 people who have been recognized by the State of Israel as righteous among the nations. They come from 50 countries, including more than 6,800 from Poland, which exceeds all other countries by, uh, uh, the nearest other country by over 1,000. It's hardly surprising that the number of Polish righteous is so high because, of course, the number of opportunities to rescue Jews was also the highest. The Nazis were in Poland for over five and a half years. Jews lived in virtually every town and village of Poland at this time, and all of them were in imminent danger of death. Every single one of them needed rescuing. The criteria are clear that to be righteous among the nations, that the awardee has to save at least one Jewish life. But there is one person among the 26,500 plus who never saved anyone. To tell this story, I have to go back to 1915, to the First World War, where a member of the German Red Cross was stationed in the deserts of Mesopotamia in current-day Turkey, where at the time over a million Armenians were being marched out of their homes into the desert, where they were being murdered in one of the first genocides of the 20th century. The young officer, in seeing this sight, was horrified. Now, as it happens, he was in a Turkish uniform, which enabled him to move back and forward freely. So he went out at the weekends with his camera, and he took photographs. He photographed everything he could see. Men, women, children, starving, thirsty, shot, hanged. There had been an order that no photography was allowed, but he photographed and he photographed and he photographed until he was caught and sent back to Germany for court-martial. But not before he'd taken the film out of the camera and placed it in the back of his aluminum belt, which he smuggled back to Germany. Today, still evidence of what happened to the Armenian people. Today, you still see these photographs telling the story of the Armenian Genocide to give visual proof of this secret crime, all taken by one man. A few years later, a German author was concerned about the rise of totalitarianism in the new Soviet Union, and so he took a journey from Moscow to Odessa. He wanted to learn about the Soviet Union, and he kept a diary. From the diary, he published a novel called Five Fingers Over You, Fünf Finger Über Dir. The novel details the rise of totalitarian rule in Russia and the threat that he saw to civilization. It warns about future atrocities that would, might come in the Soviet Union, and he kind of predicts the Stalinist era yet to come. As it happens, Five Fingers Over You was published in Germany and was on the bestsellers list at the same time as a new publication called Mein Kampf, which laid out the manifesto of a rising political leader, Adolf Hitler. By 1933, Adolf Hitler had come to power. And on the 1st of April, 1933, the first anti-Jewish boycott was instigated across all of Germany. Jewish shops and businesses were barricaded. It was very clear that the intent of the Nazis was to make it impossible for Jews to live in Germany. Dachau concentration camp had been opened the previous day, on the 31st of March 1933, just 10 weeks into Hitler's chancellorship, and the full force of Nazi rule by oppression was being deployed, and the full force of anti-Semitism being felt by the Jewish community. After these events, on the 1st of April, a German journalist sat down and wrote a letter to Hitler. In that letter, he details what had occurred and how he felt about it. He says eloquently to the Chancellor of the Weimar Republic, Adolf Hitler, as a German who has not been given the gift of speech to be silent and whose heart is quivering with indignation, I address myself to you, put a stop to all of this. He sent his letter to the newspapers. It was an open letter to Adolf Hitler. What the journalist did not realize that day was that he is the only known German civilian who formally wrote to protest the Jewish boycotts among 60 million people living in Germany that day. 
course. The journalist was arrested and was then sent to seven concentration camps before ultimately being released just before the Second World War where he was able to flee to Italy. So now I need to go forward to 1991. I was a student at Yad Vashem in their summer program learning about teaching about the Holocaust, much like we're doing here today at Polin. During the few weeks that I was there, we learned about the righteous among the nations. Somehow, and I don't remember how, I learned the story of the journalist on the 1st of April. Anyway, one afternoon, we had a few hours off from our sessions, and so I went to the old city of Jerusalem with a friend of mine who, as it happened, was German, Annegret Ehrman. We went round the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem just for something to do, to be honest. But in there, there was an Armenian cultural centre, and off the small stone courtyard was a room which described the Armenian genocide. I noticed the captions on the photographs. They appeared to have the same name. A. Wegner, A. Wegner, A. Wegner, A. Wegner, all around the room. The photos were taken by the same person. I turned to Anna Greta and I said, that's not Armin Wegner, is it? Oh yeah, she replied, that's him. Armin Wegner, the man who had taken the photographs in Armenia, was also the author of the book, Five Fingers Over You. He was also the journalist who wrote to Hitler to say, put a stop to all of this. To my knowledge, he is the only person recognized by the State of Israel as righteous among the nations who never saved a single Jewish person. He was given the award because at the time he was the only known person to have risked his own life to try and save all the Jews, even though he failed. At the time Armin Wegner was doing this, it was difficult to know what the consequences of speaking out would be. After all, until a few months earlier, Germany had been a democracy with free elections. The concentration camps were literally a few days old. There was no record of incarcerations or killings or mass murder of human beings. What intrigues me most about Wegner is that he already knew what he believed before it even started. And what's more, because he understood the past, he understood the present. He'd actually been using his conscience to speak out for a very long time. He had instincts that told him when things were wrong. And he knew how to use his voice. We also learned from Wegner that being courageous can feel like a failure. He failed to prevent the Armenian genocide, after all. He prevent, failed to prevent Stalin's whole slaughter, wholesale slaughter of his own people and he failed to prevent the Holocaust. As a voice of conscience in the 20th century, he died believing that he was a failure. This is him in 1968, planting a tree on that very avenue that we saw a few moments ago at Yad Vashem, one of the early people to be recognized. His testimony is in the USC Shoah Foundation's archive. And just for one moment, I want to listen to him sharing with us what it was like to be in uh, Turkey during the First World War. I came in Turkey as a member of the German Red Cross. And in this quality, I came through the whole desert of Mesopotamia and was a witness of the terrible persecution of the poor Armenian people and saw the terrible sacrifice. A, a witness is a very difficult task. I could never more forget what I have seen. I was always willing to speak of this terrible thing and to say to the peoples, don't care that not a second time the same terrible thing 
can repeat. 1993, Steven Spielberg was here in Poland making the film Schindler's List. During the making of that movie, several survivors came to him and they were returning to Poland for the first time, of course. It was the early 1990s. They came with their families. They came to see the places where they had been and found a movie set. Steven Spielberg normally operates his sets as a closed set, but he made an exception. If any survivor came on the set or to the set to find out what was happening, that they would be allowed on and would get to speak to him. So one day he was filming this scene at Auschwitz-Birkenau when a Holocaust survivor who was returning to Auschwitz-Birkenau for the first time came across the set. She was speaking to him and he was asking her about what he had, that, what was going on there, the dogs, the trains, the lights. And she turned and looked up at him and she said, Mr. Spielberg, I don't want to tell you about this single day in my life. I had a life before Auschwitz and I had a life after Auschwitz. I want to tell you my whole story. That's when Stephen decided to give the opportunity for survivors and witnesses to the Holocaust to tell their whole story. Five years later, 55,000 testimonies taken in 65 countries in 43 languages, making the largest archive of genocide witnesses in the world. In this remarkable project, the majority of the witnesses are survivors of the Holocaust and people who witnessed what happened during those years. Importantly, in this collection, there are also 1,160 people who were involved in the rescue of Jews during the Holocaust. The archive, of course, is available here at Paulin, so any of you that want to research this, the, in the research room here, you can find the entire archive and have a chance to look through it. In fact, let me just show you briefly what you'll find there. The Visual History Archive is the place where you will find all of these testimonies. They're all filmed in video and are available uh, by logging on. When you go into there, um, you find a search page. And in that search page, you can look through all kinds of different ways of finding testimonies. If I was to click on Experience Groups there, it's going to take me into a page where I can see a whole variety of different ways of looking through different types of people and you'll see there's 1,160 rescuers and aid providers so I can go to their testimonies directly there. I can also choose my language or my country of interview so I'm just going to click, I click Poland on this to see how many testimonies there would be and you can see on this page here in the bottom left hand corner that there are 312 testimonies taken in Poland of people who are righteous among the nations. When I get those results back, what I see is a long list of them here, and you can see this is the rescuer here, his name is Ignacy Bullock, and his language is in Polish. I can also choose my language, I can choose a collection, of, I can choose men and women, I can choose uh, different ways of exploring that content. It's there for you, so if you ever want to have a look at that, please do, because there are just amazing, amazing stories there. This is what the page looks like when you find it, um, and you can see that uh, this gentleman was in Warsaw at the point at which he was talking about his experiences. Also, the archive feeds into a teacher's uh, portal called Eyewitness. I'm sharing this with you because later today, I think uh, Monica Koshinska, who works here at Paulin, is going to give a workshop, and some of you will attend that, but I guess only a minority. So those of you do not get to see the Eyewitness website. It's there. You can just Google Eyewitness and you'll find it. Um, and in there, there are activities including, I think, six or seven in the Polish language, and the one that's been published for this conference is about the righteous um, and uh, is available as of today, which uses testimony from the archive that you can explore in your classrooms. Today I'm talking about testimony because as we talk about how do we talk about the righteous, one of the things I want to highlight is that all the righteous were people. They're not a list of statistics, they're not a data set to be just kind of examined from one place to another. They are people who tell their life story and speak about that from personal experience. Of course, in the archive as well, there are many thousands of people who talk about what it means to be rescued, um, all of which can be found in there. Uh, for your exploration. Chyba to była... um, before I sh share with that with you. These testimonies are here to share because they show the struggle. 
They show the struggle of what it mean, meant to make the decision to rescue Jewish people, particularly if you knew that the penalty of doing so would be sacrificing your own life and that of your family. To show how difficult this dilemma is, I'd like to spend a few moments of our time together listening to the testimony of Alexandra Zarin. It's a little long, but I want to take it in for just a few moments. Chyba to była wczesna jesień 43. Zjawiła się u nas Irenka, Irena Chobocka. A było to tak. Poszukiwaliśmy w tym czasie służącej do, specjalnie nawet do obsługi moich rodziców, którzy oboje byli już Nie ludźmi proszę. niepełnosprawnymi, opalenia w piecu i tak dalej. I szwagier mój pojechał w Warszawie, bo w Warszawie bywaliśmy co drugi dzień mniej więcej końmi. Szelik to było 12 km do centrum Warszawy. Pojechał na chorzą, bo słyszał, że matka Getter, przełożona zakonu gminia Margi, ma protegowane, które umieszcza w różnych rodzinach. Kiedy matka Getter mu powiedziała, że przyślę Irenę Chobocką do nas, nie sądzę, żeby już podejrzewał, że jest to Żydówka. Ale możliwe, nie, tego nie będę twierdzić. W każdym razie, kiedy Irena Chobocka zjawiła się, to pamiętam dobrze ten moment, i moje osobisty przestrach, Ponieważ była to młoda kobieta, bardzo przystojna, o wybitnie senickim wyglądzie, źle mówiąca po polsku, ponieważ całe życie, jak potem wiedziałam, mówiła jidysz w swoim domu, w Lwowie. Papiery miała w porządku, ale nikt, kto z nas pierwszy raz na nią spojrzał, nie miał najmniejszej wątpliwości. Reakcja była bardzo różna. Mój szwagier ją zaangażował, bo on angażował personę w ogóle, Szeliga. Ja byłam osobą, no, potrafiłam być odważna w momentach e, jakichś krytycznych. Natomiast przyznaję, że nie byłam odważna na długi termin. Miałam bardzo silną wyobraźnię i wiedziałam, co może spotkać wszystkich moich najbliższych za ten czyn. I przyznaję się do niezbyt ładnej karty w moim życiu, mianowicie Zresztą napisałam to także i do Instytutu, żeby nie było wątpliwości, że pojechałam do matki Getter przedstawić sytuację, że u nas we dworze już chowają się ludzie o papierach nieprawidłowych, że nasi mężowie są też zaangażowani, jak cała młodzież, że mam jedno dziecko w drodze, a, a drugie malutkie, a szwagierowie mają, szwagier i siostra, troje małych dzieci i że ja się boję. Czy jednak matka nie zechce umieścić gdzieś w innym domu? Na to matka Geter, i to pamiętam doskonale, spojrzała na mnie zimno niebieskimi oczami i zapytała mnie od góry do dołu mnie obejrzawszy, czy ty moje dziecko jesteś chrześcijanką? Z dużym znakiem zapytania na końcu. Na co ja odpowiedziałam, że tak i więcej się już nie odezwał. 
wanted to spend a few minutes listening to Alexandra's testimony because of the complexity of that. For those of you that do use the eyewitness um, activity, I think this is testimony is a part of the classroom activity, which allows to explore the complexity of what it meant to make that decision. What I love about this testimony is the fact that she's really honest with us. <laughs> the fact that she even goes to Yad Vashem to, to tell them about what her indecision was about and kind of admits that just in case they are going to take this award away because for some reason or other she wouldn't be worthy of it because of her, her really difficult dilemma, which was real. The fact that everyone was at risk and that this is an absolutely natural part of the dilemma of being involved, that you are going to risk your family's lives when you do this. Not so easy. Difficult decisions in difficult times. That's what she is sharing with us. This was a real situation. It's not that her, whole, her doubts were well, well founded. She and her family could easily have been killed and she was not prepared for that. We actually know that thousands of Poles were murdered because they were caught trying to save Jews. The families they were hiding were murdered with them. And so there are no witnesses, no record, no trace. <coughs> like Wegner, these courageous people died as failures, with no recognitions, no awards, no honour. I guess that's why the plan for a new memorial here at Polin plays an important role, not only for those that we know, but for those that we don't, to say, even if we don't know who you are, we want to be like you. Because of the Righteous Among the Nations Award, we do know that at least 6,863 Polish people have been verified as rescuers with those exacting standards of Yad Vashem. But of course, it took many people to save each Jewish life because no one acted alone, no one could act alone. We also need to be honest though, because these precious people were the exception and not the rule. As amazing as they were, and as much as they represent the very best of humanity, they were a very tiny minority of the population. If there were 50 times the number uh, we have on the, board, on the screen here, it would still be only 1% of the population. In other words, 1 50th of 1% of the population have been recognized for their selfless courage. I'm very cautious about using numbers to speculate. Actually, whenever I deal with the issue of genocide, numbers themselves very rarely mean very much. But let's just say that 10 people in total played a role in each rescue that we knew. That would make it nearer 68,000 people who were involved in these rescue efforts here in Poland. That would get us to one-fifth of 1% 1 of the population over five and a half years. If we take out the children and the elderly and infirm who maybe couldn't act on their own, that would get us to about one-third of 1% 1 of the active population. So it's hardly a groundswell of feverish activity when we know that Jews lived in every single town and village in the country. In fact, there would have needed to be 200,000 Polish people involved in rescue efforts just to get to 1% of the population over five and a half years. As a total... Righteous Among the Nations is getting close to 27,000 people who have been officially recognized now. So of course there were likely many, many more who are not known or not recognized. But let's just say for a moment that's all that we know of and that's all of them. It's an amazing group of people who would fill a decent sized football stadium. But when you apply that to the entire continent of Europe across a five and a half year time span, it's less than one hundredth of one percent. It meant that 13 people each day made a difficult choice to risk their lives for a Jewish person. When you apply that to the 26 territories occupied and controlled by the Nazis, that's one person making that choice in each territory every other day. At some point in mid-1941, there were actually 9 million opportunities every single day for someone to rescue a Jewish person because every Jewish person in Nazi territory was marked for death as the final solution began at the height of Nazi control of Europe in 1941. But in fact, I use these numbers only to illustrate that it's not about numbers. 
Because acts of courage cannot be calculated en masse. Well, not usually. The whole point is that these were deeply personal decisions and often made on the spur of the moment. The question is, what would you do if you got a knock on the door of the middle of, in the middle of the night to find a Jewish child staring up at you? It was not so easy. In the Talmud, the Jewish holy book, which we can learn about in the museum downstairs, it makes clear, he who saves a single life saves the world entire. This is about individual acts of courage, about the choice of one person and what one person can do and what that means to us all. Often when we talk about the righteous among the nations, we think of it in a national context. The state honors people who at the time did not represent the views or actions of the state or even the majority of the population. But because history turned out to be on their side, we honor them in the hopes that they reflect well on all of us, including the state. There were very few cases, in fact, where the national leaders did anything to intervene. King Boris III, as seen here with Adolf Hitler, as you can see, had to make his peace with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. But interestingly, most of Bulgarian Jewry was saved, for which Boris III generally often gets the praise. But in fact, it was not really anything to do with Boris III himself. It was the grassroots and particularly religious leaders who seeing the deportation of the Jews protested, threatening to lie on the railway lines between Sofia and Auschwitz. Only then did King Boris reluctantly set up labor camps in Bulgaria and told the Nazis that he needed the Jews to build railroads and so that they were not sent to death camps. There's also a few cases where people organise themselves as a group, reflecting maybe a national conscience, as was in the case of Denmark, where some 7,220 Jews and 686 of their spouses were saved by the Danish resistance movement. In fact, an announcement was made in the synagogue just before Rosh Hashanah in 1943 on the 29th of September that the Jewish population must go immediately into hiding because word had been given actually by one of the Nazi organizers of the deportation of Danish Jews that on the 1st of October they would be deported. The whole of the Danish Jewish population disappeared into hiding the following day eventually making their way to the coast where Danish fishermen and others would be waiting to transport them to Sweden. As a result of this group activity, 99% of Danish Jews survived the Second World War. This is Lolly Samosh, who's in the archive, who you can hear if you uh, go to the archive and search under Denmark and the rescue of the Jews. She describes her family waiting by the water's edge. There were 12 children in her family, 14 people including the parents, in a boat that was big enough for 10. Everyone was brought to the water's edge, including other Jews that were waiting to uh, get in the same boat, only to find that the boat was too small. Some of the Jews returned to the barn where they'd be hiding. She and the 12 children were rowed across by a single oarsman from Denmark to Sweden. As remarkable as these examples are, in most cases, of course, rescue is a matter of personal choice. Actually, the danger was even greater, because in most countries that the Germans occupied, the national government local administration and civilian police had little choice but to align themselves with the German forces and administer their genocidal policies. So it wasn't only individuals against the Nazis, it was individuals against their own population, or at least with the potential of being exposed by their own population and peers. No more so, of course, than in Poland, where it was difficult to know who to trust at any given moment. The large numbers of people involved in resistance to the German occupiers was matched by those who could gain something and those who kept a safe distance. This meant it was extremely dangerous to be involved in the rescue of the Jews because you're not only going up against the occupying forces, but perhaps also against the prevailing wisdom of your compatriots, your neighbors. Everyone was trying to survive in their own way, measured by their own values. And what do you know about your neighbor's values? 
As we heard from Alexandra Zarin a few moments ago, very often the families that were involved in underground ac resistance activities were also most likely to rescue Jews. Not because they knew Jewish people or respected them necessarily, but because the enemy of the Poles were murdering the Jews, so rescuing the Jews was by default an act of resistance in its own right. For a few moments I'd like to explore the story of Genia Schwartzman, Gina Schwartzman. See what she has to say about this. At early, very early in the morning, I was uh, taken by a Polish policeman and by Janina Pigułowska, the, the housekeeper of Mr. Lipinski, to a station, and from there we traveled to Warsaw. Uh, you know, uh, look, uh, it's such a long time away that I don't know if I stayed there one night or more, but to me it seems just a few hours after. And I haven't seen my mother since, and um, I stayed with the family Grudzinski um, from 1942. Uh, July 1942 till March 1945. So at the heart of uh, Genya Schwartzman's story is a couple, Leon and Zofia Grudzinski. Their motivation actually was not to rescue Jewish children. They were Polish anti-fascists who had only one thing in mind and that was defeating the German occupation of Poland. Professor Leon Grodzinski was evicted from Warsaw University and took up a job at the Warsaw Zoo. When I first heard this story, I felt very sorry for the professor who was demeaned to cleaning animal dung this way. Only subsequently did I learn about Jan and Antonina Zabinski, the zoo director and his wife, of course, who were friends of the Grodzinskis and worked to rescue Jews with fem f uh, other members of the Army of Krajowa. The Grodzinski family were already deeply embedded in resistance activities. In 2002, I had the privilege of coming here to Poland and going to Radom with Genia to make a short documentary entitled The Power of Goodness. Here's a clip from the documentary which details the lives of the Grudzinskis. When the Nazis occupied Poland, Zofia Grudzinska was a housewife. For her, like most Poles, the Nazis were the enemy, and she wanted to play her part in defeating them, as did most of her family. Her husband, Leon, was an outspoken academic who soon lost his job at the university to end up working in the city zoo. Her 20-year-old daughter, Zofia Jr., known as Zosia, and her 18-year-old son, Stefan, joined the resistance in the Parasola division of the Armia Krajowa the underground Polish army. Her nine-year-old daughter, Mira, was employed as a messenger for the resistance. Zofia Grudzinska was the motivating force behind these activists in her family, determined that the Germans would not win the war. Then, one day, she received a message from her sister, Janina, from Radom. Janina had been approached about a Jewish child from the ghetto in Radom. She wanted to know whether Zofia could give the child refuge. Genia Rapoport was six years old when the Nazis had invaded Poland. By 1941, she was an eight-year-old starving child in the Radom ghetto when her parents told her she was going to have to leave. My father said, say goodbye to mom. And they sort of shouted. Saying, Bye, Mom. I didn't hear Genya arrived at the Grudzinski's fourth floor family home in the spring of 1942. For two years, she became a member of the Grudzinski family. This included being part of the resistance, running on a regular basis to the Floriansky church with messages and pamphlets for the priest. Leon Grudzinski was exposed and sent to labor camp in Germany. He never returned. Zosia Grudzinski was caught and sent to the notorious Paviak prison. She was tortured 
and then shot at the age of 21. Today, the memorial at the Paviak bears her name with other Polish resistance workers. Stefan Grudzinski was also caught and tortured at the Paviak. He was then sent to Stutthof concentration camp, surviving 10 months of the most unbearable conditions during the winter of 1944. So it was an unknown policeman that took them to the train in Rally. It was Janina Pikowska who delivered her to the apartment of her sister. In fact, in just the first day of being outside the ghetto, three people worked to pass this Jewish child to safety. What she didn't tell us here, we didn't learn here, was that she'd already been to two other homes. This was her third attempt, Janina's third attempt, to save this one child. So at least eight people were involved in saving one eight-year-old child. That's after the two other families had already tried and failed, which meant there were 14 people in total just to get this one child to a safe house in Warsaw. The day after Genya left the ghetto in Radom, her mother committed suicide. See, it was not easy wasn't easy for anyone. During our visit in 2002, we went to the award ceremony for Zofia Grudzinska, which you see here, which was held at the Israeli embassy. There in the room were the Grudzinski children, Stefan and Mira, both present to see the award given in the name of their mother and parents. I learned something from this trip that I had not expected to learn that the power of goodness is something that transcends generations. In the same way that we talk about trauma transcending generations, goodness, it seems, can be passed down too. We travelled from London to Warsaw, and at the airport we met the Grudzinski family. For the children on both sides of this story, it was the first time that either of them had met. It's difficult to describe that moment when these families came together, but I guess it was something like going to a wedding. Not everybody at the wedding knows each other. Not everyone has very much in common necessarily except the bride and the groom and the celebration that they are having at that moment. In this case, there were two families from two countries that spoke completely different languages and had two completely different religious traditions. Putting it bluntly, they had absolutely nothing in common except, of course, the rescue of Genya Schwartzman and the courage of Zofia and Leon Grudzinski. Let me just show you a few seconds of this ceremony. The first stop was the embassy for the presentation of the Righteous Among the Nations Award to Zofia's son, Stefan. And on behalf of Yad Vashem and my colleagues here, I would like to give you this document. To that Kavot Victim Honorary and this medal. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The town was absolutely black. Everything was dark. And to realize that such bravery existed amongst such hatred is, is unbelievable. And in Hebrew, we, we call the really righteous people Sadikim. And I can't think of a more appropriate way to describe Stefan and Mira's family. And really, our whole generation that can grow up free to be who we are, what we want to be. It's, it's thanks. <laughs> Mieliśmy trochę bliższych, ale wymarli, prawda? Natomiast ja z Olejniką mieliśmy wspólnego braciaszka. Although I didn't understand everything that the ambassador was talking about, for people to understand the emotion, it's the only time I've cried listening to a language that I don't understand. Recent research that delved into the USC Shoah Foundation's archive shows that the motivations to act usually involved three factors. Scholar Suzanne Beer discovered that people involved in rescue were often involved in other networks. 
Actually, this was true of the Grudzinskis. They were already active in the army of Krajowa. They had a cause. They had other people to help. Secondly, people involved in rescue often had some personal connection to Jewish people before the war. Even sometimes quite tenuous, and not often the person that they rescued. We don't know specifically about the Grudzinskis, but we do know that Leon was a professor at Warsaw University. Living in the academic and cultural milieu in which he did, there's a very high likelihood that he was part of, he would come into connection with the Polish population that interacted with the cultural and political life of the assimilated Jews of the city of Warsaw. Thirdly, there used to be need, there always needs somebody to ask. Strangely, if you don't ask, it very rarely happened. Zofia was asked by her sister Janina. She wasn't looking to take in Jewish children. But once Janina asked her, she arranged to have her taken from Gradom. And on both occasions, um, when Janina tried previously, she had directly asked the people who rescued her. This time, Zofia was her last resort. Lisa Vincent, who managed to escape Nazi Germany just days before the Second World War, reminded me that moral courage only requires us to do what is within our own power. One day, I was watching her speaking at this place, the UK Holocaust Centre, to a group of stu students in the museum. As founder and director of the museum, I often sat and listened to the talks. But one day, I asked, heard a young person asking her, Miss, what was the worst experience that you had? I knew Lisa's story, so I imagined what she was going to answer. The destruction of her family business, the divorce of her parents after the Nuremberg Laws, because her father was a German, the deportation of her grandparents to Treblinka, being the sole survivor of her family. But no. She told the story about being the only Jewish girl in her class, being sent to the back of the class because she was a Jew. Bewildered, she sat there until the bell rang for the break. Because she was at the back of the class and the door was at the front of the room, she was the last to leave the classroom. But she knew for sure that her friend Susie Schmidt would be waiting for her to comfort her after this terrible humiliation. But she saw the back of Susie disappear around the corridor and she never spoke to her again. Lisa recalled to the students, this was the moment I lost all hope. I knew that if Susie was not able to give me a hug and say, everything's going to be okay, then nothing was going to be okay. Another student asked her a question, so what am I supposed to do with that, miss? She responded, you are not expected to do anything more than is in your power. But make sure you do everything that is within your power. If you're a student, give your classmate a hug so they don't feel alone. If you're the teacher, say, in my class, we're not sending Jews to the back of the room. If you're the school principal, say, in my school, we do not humiliate our Jewish children. If you're the school district superintendent, say, in my district, our schools will not do this. If you're the minister of education, remind your prime minister that school is for education, not indoctrination. If you're the prime minister, remind the president that his or her responsibility is to protect the civilian population from exclusion and humiliation. She said, right now, you're in class, just like Susie Schmidt. But soon you will be the teachers, the superintendents, the ministers that govern the land. So make sure you know what your values are right now and do everything you can to uphold those throughout the rest of your life. Actually, the righteous among the nations it seems that they were exceeding their power. But if you look at their lives, they were doing what they could, always living to the ultimate of their influence and power. Of course, as the war unfolded, the reality of occupation and war is a totally different matter to a classroom. 
Every day was different. There is no one size fits all. Jews were like this, Germans were like that, Poles were like the other. Some generalizations, of course, can be made. The Germans were in control. They did subjugate Poland. They murdered three million Poles. They enslaved hundreds of thousands of Polish citizens and committed genocide against the Jews by building killing centers right here on Polish soil. It's absolutely true that Poles were subjugated, that their country was turned into a slave labor, a complex of slave labor camps to serve the Third Reich, that economic and political influence was devastated, and the slightest hint of dissent was crushed mercilessly. It's absolutely true that all Jews living in Poland, without exception, were destined to be murdered by the Nazis. There was no escape. But given these overarching truths, there were also many choices made on a daily basis that created the exceptions, many exceptions. Sure, many of you know this particular novel by Andrzej Szczepiorski, the beautiful, whoops, it's upside down, no, sorry, the beautiful Mrs. Seidemann, who with her blonde hair and blue eyes was living outside the ghetto, who spotted outside on the street and denounced by a Polish Jewish collaborator, Bronik Blutman. The novel follows her story for 36 hours that she's in captivity. Szczepiorski paints the picture of a complex world which reveals Poles who helped Jews, Poles who did not, Germans who followed orders, Germans that get her released, Jews who collaborated, Jews that worked with the resistance, Jews that struggled to survive and succumbed to death anyway. Obviously, this is a work of fiction. But Szczepiorski digs deep into the reality that there really were no good choices. But nevertheless, everyone made choices and the choices changed from day to day, and that today's choice becomes tomorrow's decision. Sometimes when we tell these stories, we make the mistake of presenting these amazing people as representatives of the whole. After all, they make us feel good, look good. Inadvertently, we make them appear like they are the rule, but in fact, they were always the exception. When we speak about the righteous, we need to make sure we are clear they were the exception. We now know they were on the right side of history, but that is not what they experienced. They experienced daily paralyzing fear, anxiety, dread, the inevitable cost of death. Every time that Irena Sendler made one of her runs to go and save children, she experienced that. She wasn't thinking about awards and memorials and education conferences like this and classroom resources. They were living in a fog of self-doubt, not knowing who they could trust and with the certainty that they would be caught and probably die. It was not easy. The cost was very high. Very soon there will be a new memorial built here at the Paulin Museum to remember the righteous among the nations. It's a fitting place for that because those who risked their own lives not only saved Jewish lives but saved our hope in humanity. They were very few in number and humble in spirit but they are the giants of the time. Those we know of and those we do not. Our gratitude is to them. Our gratitude is to them because it shows us what we can be like. It shows that in times of difficulty and trouble, that if we keep our humanity, if we know our values, like Roddy Edmonds, we know that we can all say we are all Jews here. I'm often asked the question, so how come there were so few people that rescued Jews during the Holocaust? Why were there so few? Actually, that's the wrong question. Or at least, it's not a question that we here are entitled to ask. Well, if you know for sure that today you are willing to risk your life for a complete stranger, that you will risk your spouse, your children, your life, your home, everything for a person you do not know, then for sure you are entitled to ask the question, why were there so few? But if you cannot say for certain that if you got a knock on the door tonight from a complete stranger that you would definitely risk your life and that of your family for that unknown person for whom you have no responsibility, 
then the only question you can really ask is, how were there so many? And how can I be like them? Thank you.